A jealous wife turned a gun on herself as her eyes pleaded for mercy. All she wanted was the affection of a husband who had neglected her to the point of desperation. The response was pure unconcern from the husband. He willed her to end it all. He could not just care what she did or how she lived. At that point, Yvonne Chevalier wanted to die by pulling the trigger on herself. Nothing made sense anymore in her world. The husband of her youth and the father of her children wanted nothing to do with her. She was lost, exhausted, and did not just have the will to go on. Something snapped in her mind, and she withdrew the gun from herself, pointed it at Pierre Chevalier, her husband. Join us as we delve into the sensational story of Yvonne Chevalier, a rare woman. The year was 1935, in the midst of the French Resistance, a period when Germany was about to go into war with its neighbours. It was hardly a scene you would picture romance in, but theirs happened instant and filled with passion, classic recipes for love. This era was marked by social classism, but so strong was their love that they overcame all forms of inequalities. Yvonne Rousseau, a 24-year-old woman, came from a lowly background. She was raised on a peasant farm. On the other hand, Pierre Chevalier, just two years older at 26 years of age, was a medical student from a notable family. Pierre was a descendant of a powerful family, and their love could not help but raise eyebrows. The two met at the Orléans Hospital, where Yvonne happened to work as a midwife. So in love were they with intense physical emotions that their interaction was described in the judge's exact words as an intense physical and emotional craving, an animal passion. One can only imagine how inseparable they were. Their love was so strong that in just a few weeks of meeting each other, Yvonne moved in with Pierre, and with the war approaching, they proceeded to get married and start a family, with two sons following soon after. Their love was stuff of romance books you would easily find on the shelf of a dime store novel, the type that leaves the heart of the reader yearning for more as they get uneasy, burning with sweet sensations from within. The lithe body of the timid Yvonne was just graceful enough for the charming doctor, and nothing, not a single thing, could stop the raw passion the couple had for each other. Some may say that the lovebirds' relationship was not tested by time, but for the two, love was enough for them. There was nothing time would do to them that it was not already doing. Their relationship was one marked with love and joy, thriving right in the midst of tragedy and war. But tragedy awaits even the fiercest of love stories. As the French general Charles de Gaulle broadcast through the English Channel just four days before the surrender of the French, Pierre Chevalier listened. But has the last word been spoken? Must hope disappear? Is defeat final? No, believe me, I speak to you with full knowledge of the facts and tell you that nothing is lost for France. The same means that overcame us can bring us to a day of victory, for France is not alone. She is not alone. She is not alone. She has a vast empire behind her. She can align with the British Empire that holds the sea and continues the fight. She can, like England, use without limit the immense industry of the United States. This war is not limited to the unfortunate territory of our country. The destiny of the world is here. I, General de Gaulle, currently in London, invite the officers and the French soldiers who are located in British territory, or who would come there, with their weapons or without their weapons. I invite the engineers and the special workers of armament industries who are located in British territory, or who would come there to put themselves in contact with me. Whatever happens, the flame of the French resistance must not be extinguished and will not be extinguished. That evening in June 1940, Yvonne had just given birth to Mathieu, their first child, and as a doctor in training just into the final stretch of his learning, Pierre could have joined the number of people who surrendered to the German Blitzkrieg. No single person would have blamed that act or called him a coward, as the circumstances were dire and he would probably be choosing what was best for him and his new family. In an interesting move, Pierre did not surrender. Instead of that, he opted to join the Free French Movement. Pierre was one of about 7,000 Frenchmen who willingly followed the lead of de Gaulle, six weeks after France had surrendered to Germany. This presented him as one of the leading figures of the French's resistance in New Orleans. Over the ensuing four years that the war lasted, the movement continued to grow and gather momentum. While the resistance happened to be a passive organization for some, Chevalier was an active part of the resistance, participating and pulling off sabotage missions in a daring way, 
against the unfriendly German occupiers. Before the D-Day in 1994, a movement that started with a mere 7,000 men already had 400,000 Frenchmen. The Allies bombed Orleans that summer in the hopes of cutting off the river crossings of the Germans that were retreating. On August 16, 1944, exactly 10 weeks after the D-Day, the Allied soldiers arrived. They were there at last to liberate Orleans, but they soon discovered a shadow government that was not only thriving, but was efficiently run by Yvonne's heartthrob, Pierre Chevalier. This amazed the Allies, as they were not expecting to meet Orléans in such a subtle good state. There was no doubt that Pierre Chevalier would be recognized for his outstanding service and devotion to France. Pierre Chevalier was honored with the French Légion d'honneur and Croix de Guerre for his heroism in a time of war. Aside from that, he was also elected as the mayor of his adorable hometown once the war ended, much to the admiration and delight of the people. Well, the beginning of their adventurous relationship may have looked promising, but unfortunately, things quickly took a turn for the worse when Pierre no longer returned the love and feeling Yvonne had for him. This one-sided affair tortured his ever-devoted wife so, and ultimately drove her to jealousy, which laid the foundation for the tragedy that followed in the later years of their marriage. Yvonne had given birth to two children by Pierre, and had been a dutiful wife. She had watched her husband play the hero, and had gladly enjoyed being in the background since she was aware that her husband was hers and hers alone. While Yvonne raised the children, Chevalier devoted himself to the rebuilding process of France. He was elected into the National Assembly and soon became a mentee of René Pleven, a fellow who himself was a freedom fighter and was the Minister of Finance when the war ended. Chevalier, like any other politician, started spending more time in Paris, as was the custom. Paris was the seat of government, and since he needed to maintain a busy schedule and show up for social functions, it was only wise to devote more time there. Yvonne, his wife, rarely accompanied him, perhaps out of respect or disinterest. She had never been a social butterfly, and some members of the Chevalier family would later describe her as a social recluse, someone who did not find attending social functions delightful. Chevalier was well-spoken, composed, and by French standards, a dashing man, he had no problem standing tall and dignified in a crowd of strangers. He was confident and had the attention of the room if he needed it. Yvonne pales in comparison to her husband. She had no social skills like her husband and was not a Broadway beauty to behold. She was plain, gaunt, and her picture at age 40 reminds one of the American actress Nancy Culp, who played the homely Miss Hathaway in the TV series The Beverly Hillbillies Is. In biographical sketches, she was painted as witless, dull, uncouth, and an uneducated girl raised on a farm who would actually enjoy life in a barnyard rather than a castle. Colin Wilson, a crime author, referred to her as gauche, clumsy with conversations and awkward in his publication Mammoth Book of True Crime. There was no doubt the couple were two different sides of a coin. After 12 years of marriage, it seemed Pierre Chevalier had grown largely uninterested. He began to treat his wife with a certain cool demeanor that was uncharacteristic of him. Mathieu, their first child, developed an illness in 1950. In a bid to be close to the boy in situations of emergencies, Yvonne moved the boy into the bedroom she shared with her husband. Pierre moved to the study and began to sleep there until Mathieu recovered from the illness. Pierre grew distant. Yvonne tried to get her husband to like her again and started reading about art and literature and dived into happenings in politics to stay informed and be abreast of events in the society. She made appointments at beauty salons and got elegant dresses to re-invite the appeal she once had for her husband. On nights they spent in the privacy of their home, she tried to woo her husband again with romance, but her husband made it abundantly clear that he was no longer interested in intimacy. "'You disgust me,' Pierre said emphatically. His coolness had become contempt. In the delicate dance of love, the intrusion of a third person always complicates the steps. For Pierre and Yvonne, the erosion of their bond seemed inevitable as Pierre distanced himself, not just emotionally but physically, drawn away by desires his wife could no longer satisfy. Jeanne Perrault was notorious for having many affairs, and like Yvonne and Pierre, she was also a mismatch with her bald-headed husband, Leon Perrault. Leon was middle-aged, rotund and short. He owned New Orleans' most prestigious department stores. For Leon, business came first. He ran the stores with a heavy hand and was away from home from dawn to dusk six days a week. This meant his redhead wife, Jeanne, was left all by herself with nothing to do. 
Jan was 15 years younger than her husband and spent most of her time traveling in literary circles as well as among intellectuals. She dressed stylishly, had a lovely face, and would make most men swoon at just a glance towards them. She was the perfect definition of charming and interesting. The Chevalier boys spent time playing with their wealthy neighbors, the Perrault's three children. Soon, both couples started socializing and, most times, the reason Pierre Chevalier would leave Paris to come home was for a dinner date with the Perrault's. Soon the rumor about Jeanne Perrault's string of romantic lovers and illicit affairs reached the ears of Yvonne. This threw her into a fit of anxiety. She became so nervous that she needed the attention of doctors. They prescribed drugs she would soon start abusing, like Maxiton and Veronal. Maxiton was an amphetamine, and Veronal was a barbiturate. When she was not popping pills, she was either slugging down coffee or chain-smoking cigarettes. She soon developed a condition known as hooded eyes. To worsen her condition, she received an anonymous letter. In the letter, she was informed that the notorious Jeanne Perrault had just won the heart of her husband. The distraught woman went off to search her husband's closet, where she found a crumpled letter. The letter read, Dear Pierre, without you, life would have no beauty or meaning for me. The letter was then signed with the name Jeannette. When Yvonne started to make her findings, she discovered the affair was an open secret. Yvonne took a trip to Paris via train after leaving her children in the chair of a maid with the intent of confronting her husband. She was turned away. She made other trips that turned out to be futile as well. One of such was the one she made to the National Assembly, where an usher had informed Mrs. Chevalier she was not welcome. The trips became humiliating, and after trying her best to win back her husband to no avail, she went back to New Orleans. In New Orleans, she sought out Jeanne Perrault to speak to her, but the meeting ended with both women accusing each other of moral and marital mistakes and flaws. It is safe to say the meeting ended in an ugly way without resolution. When she approached Leon Perrault to discuss the same matter, the man said he knew all about it and did not want to be involved. Yvonne's heart broke a little more than it had before. She sought for a way out of the mess but couldn't find any. Her husband, Pierre, decided to give her a chance and came home to hear what she had to say. Yvonne begged and cajoled her husband to return to her, but he stuck with his decision to remain with Jeanne. Yvonne took a vacation and went with her sons in the hopes that the distance might make her husband miss her and want her. When she returned, nothing had changed. Mr. Chevalier was certain that the marriage would lead to a divorce. France, though a Catholic nation, tolerated affairs but left marriage as a sacred entity that it was. Pierre was on course to be chosen as the Minister for Education, Youth and Athletics. He still treated his wife with the same contempt and derision. Yvonne turned to suicide and swallowed all her pills. Unfortunately, she didn't die. When she recovered, she found her way to a police station, where she got a license to purchase a gun. Her reason was that she needed it for security since her husband was about to be elected into a high office. She got the permit and bought a MAB 7.65mm French semi-automatic gun that had a nine-round magazine. Chevalier was sworn into office in Paris. The following day, he had a public occasion to attend, and as the place was not far from New Orleans, he told his chauffeur to stop at his home, where he would change his clothes. That was probably the grave mistake of his life. The chauffeur did as told. Yvonne followed Pierre to his room upstairs. In a last attempt to save their marriage, Yvonne started to talk to her husband. She began with a threat. She declared that she would take the children to boarding school and deny him visits. This did not move Pierre in the slightest. Next, Yvonne confessed that she couldn't imagine him in the arms of another woman, as she could never love another man as much as she loved him. She cried, suggesting she would change and become a worthy companion to him. This, too, fell on deaf ears, her husband's deaf ears. Finally, as Pierre put off his dressing, Yvonne sank her knees into the ground and begged Pierre Chevalier to love her. He was dismissive of her plea. That day, he broached the topic of divorce through gritted teeth, saying he could not possibly love Yvonne, and that he would be a happier man with Jeanne Perrault. Yvonne fled from her room and returned with her MAB pistol. She turned the gun on herself, threatening to commit suicide. Pierre could not be bothered and remained emotionless towards her plight. He looked at her and coldly told her to go ahead, showing no intention of stopping her. A maid waited with the children downstairs, listening to the exchange between the couple. Ignoring Pierre's indifference, Yvonne then aimed the gun at Pierre, shooting him four times. The maid heard all the shots, afraid for her life, 
and fearing what the investigation might bring, remained downstairs. Mathieu, now ten years of age, ran up the stairs and saw the lifeless body of his father. Yvonne took the boy's hand in a calm manner and handed him to the maid to keep him in her care. The maid heard a final fifth shot and cowered in fear as Yvonne returned upstairs to Chevalier's room. Yvonne dialed the New Orleans police headquarters and said to them, My husband needs you urgently. When the police officers arrived, Yvonne was dressed in black mourning clothes. She had shot her husband in the chest, forearm, chin and thigh. The fifth shot was aimed at his back as he lay on the ground, dying. The news spread like wildfire and received so much attention. The story became the front page news in France for several months. Papers from Britain, Italy and Spain recounted the ordeal in lovely prose. The story was featured in the New York Times and an even longer epistle in the New Yorker magazine. Yvonne had not mentioned the love triangle in the first questioning she sat under by the police, and a lot of Frenchmen were enraged at what had occurred. When Yvonne confessed her jealousy of the redhead that her husband had abandoned her for, people started to be sympathetic towards her. The trial was highly entertaining, yet brief. Yvonne had spent months in detention and had grown lean and gaunt. The figure the court saw was that of a frail woman, garnering the sympathy of spectators, journalists, and a judge, Raymond Jadin. The jury of seven spent 16 hours listening to the case. The judge asked Yvonne about her marriage and her family. The woman found herself sobbing as she described her husband's bourgeois family. She added that her husband's family regarded her as one of the mistakes of Pierre's youth. Judge Jadin continued the questioning, asking Yvonne to shed light on the hostile meeting that ensued between her and Jeanne Perrault after the affair was made known to her. The poor woman denied the judge's quiz about her intent on murdering her husband because the man was seeing Jeanne Perrault. You added that it would be a crime of passion and you would be acquitted, the judge pressed. C'est faux, she cried. That meant that's not true in English. Jadan wanted to know and asked what her reaction was after her husband told her about the divorce. Yvonne tried to answer, found herself stammering and then fainted. A 15-minute recess followed. After that, Judge Jadan questioned Yvonne about the fifth shot. She told the judge that she had initially thought to go and kill herself near her lover when she returned upstairs. She said the gun fired accidentally into the back of her victim. Although spectators murmured at that, Jadan let the explanation stand without further questions. When Jeanne Perrault was called to the witness stand, she gave her information to the court, and blocking out the hisses from the spectators in the court, she stood her ground. When the judge inquired if she had any shame for having an affair after three children, she said she was not sorry about the affair she had with Pierre as she loved him passionately. The only person she had a bit of sympathy for was Mrs. Chevalier. She added that she would have remained with Pierre if his wife had not murdered him. The defense attorney shouted that her place was in the dock, to which the audience agreed. Jurors watched as a thousand people gathered outside the Rhymes Palace of Justice, which was situated around the city square. Support for Yvonne came in the form of a chant in unison, Liberez La, meaning free her. After 45 minutes of deliberation, the jurors declared her innocent, as the Chevalier case was seen as a clear-cut but a gender-reversal example of the crime of passion provision. The provision set free men who caught their wives in bed with another man and killed them in the act. Yvonne Rousseau Chevalier tried to continue living in France, but her reputation as France's first ever criminal passionnel, the first woman to murder a man in a crime of passion, would not allow it. She joined her son on her family farm and was absolved by the Catholic Church for the crime she committed. The absolution was necessary in Catholicism, as it is an important aspect of her criminal trial for the observant woman. Unable to go on, she was overwhelmed with guilt, notoriety and heartaches. She took advice from priests around her and decided to move away and start life anew somewhere else. She served a self-imposed punishment by moving with her sons to French New Guinea in West Africa. She lived out her years volunteering as a nurse in a local hospital for the poor. And there goes the story of Yvonne Chevalier, who turned the gun on her husband as it was her last resort to find peace, to find joy. In the end, she lost her lover and went to live out her years elsewhere. She was said to have died in obscurity in the 1970s and today she is referred to as Cupid's mistake, a result of mismatched love.